if you have your Bibles, turn with me again to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning as we just continue walking through uh, this letter of 1 Corinthians together verse by verse. And uh, I do want to just take the opportunity to say Happy Father's Day. It encourages my heart greatly to see all of you men here this morning. Uh, that is a desperate need that we have in our churches. And so it was just an encouragement to my heart just as we stood at the beginning of the service to see you. And, and I thank the Lord for his grace, uh, just allowing you to be here this morning. And, and uh, we want to give honor where honor is due. It is right for us to honor fathers. And I, and I know that uh, everybody's in a different place with that. And, and so uh, we just... Uh, we just thank the Lord for his goodness this morning, allowing us to be in his house and to worship him. Let's, let's have a word of prayer together before we get into the word of God. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can say that today. It's an awesome and incredible thing that we can call you Father. that you would love, that you would care, that you would choose men and women like us to be your children. We thank you for the incredible work of Jesus on the cross that draws us to you, that reconciles us to yourself, that we might cry out to you, Abba, Father. Heavenly Father, you are good, and you enjoy giving good gifts to your children, I pray this morning as we come into your presence, uh, that we would receive what you have for us. Oh Lord, may you exhort and rebuke those who need it this morning, knowing that is a good gift from you. May you comfort and strengthen and encourage those who need it this morning. Father, we pray that your word would go forth in power. That your spirit would move mightily among us. That Jesus would be exalted. But perhaps there would be some in our midst who is yet to come to know you in this intimate way as a father. And we pray that they would hear with new ears, that you would give them eyes to see their need of a Savior, and they might come to know you today. We would rejoice in that. Father, we leave it all in your hands, trusting that you would accomplish your good purposes. We pray, and we ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. <clears throat> well, as a faith family. We've just been walking through this letter of Paul verse by verse, and this morning, by God's providence, uh, our passage this morning is fitting for this special day as we talk about fatherhood. Uh, and and uh, you know, I didn't plan that out necessarily, but again, the Lord just <laughs> worked that out uh, by his sovereignty. And we know if you've been here over the last several weeks, <clears throat> Paul has been addressing some serious issues within the church at Corinth. Uh, we have said all along, the church is a mess, right? And, and so there is division and there's disunity that's taking place within the church. Um, there's a, a wrong view of leadership within the church. There's pride. We talked last week about those puffed up Christians. And uh, so just a lot of issues. And Paul's primary antidote for each one of those has been to point them to the cross, because in the cross that we truly find the answer to our needs and to our sin and to our pride. And so he's continually pointing them back to the cross of Christ. Now if you were with us last week, then you'll remember that Paul began to use some very strong language in his letter. Uh, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was sarcastic. Uh, he, he used some questions that were very pointed that were meant to deflate those puffed up people. It was meant to hit them right where they needed to be hit so that they might be humbled. Now, what Paul knows is this. Such strong language could be received in a, in a way that he did not intend. And so he wants to clarify his intent in our passage this morning. Now, 
what I want you to see, first of all, is Paul's identity as a spiritual father this morning. Paul's identity as a spiritual father. We see it in verses 14 and 15. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Right? So Paul's identifying, clarifying his relationship with the people in the church at Corinth. He says, the last thing I wanted to do is, is to shame you or to hurt you, but I'm concerned about you with the love of a father. Now, now most of us can understand that this morning, right? There are times, right, as a father, as a parent, where you have to do and you have to say things that are hard. <laughs> and, and sometimes you have to be strict or stern and all along, that sternness, that strictness is rooted in love. And, and that's what Paul wants to say this morning. He, wants to, he just wants to remind them that he is a spiritual father to them. Now, I, 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 I guess the question we need to answer is this. In what sense is Paul their father? He says, I became, in verse 15, I became your father through the gospel. And so, understanding that Paul was the agent that God used to bring the gospel to the Corinthians, right? You see the account in Acts chapter 18, when Paul arrived and he, he was living with Priscilla and Aquila and he was preaching the gospel and people were getting saved day after day. And so Paul was the initial one who brought the good news of Jesus Christ to the Corinthian People. He's the one who shared with them of Jesus' substitutionary death. He's the one who told them about Jesus' sin-defeating resurrection. And many of them believed. And they put their faith in Jesus Christ. And it's in that sense that Paul says, I became your spiritual father. We have a unique relationship. He says you have many guides. Your, your KGV says 10,000. It's just the Countless, it's a num beyond number, beyond a, a ability to count. You have countless guides, countless teachers, but you don't have many fathers. And Paul's just reminding them of this relationship that he has with them, a close, intimate relationship. Paul's the one who led many of these individuals in the church to the Lord. It's, it's a word that's used often to, to speak of... Someone becoming a physical parent. Right? I mean, a father is someone who has a child. <laughs> if you don't have a child, you're not a father. And so you become a father by producing offspring, right? But Paul was the one who, all in a spiritual sense, produced offspring. He became a spiritual father. Oftentimes, the scripture speaks of being born, right? Being born again, of begetting. And, and Paul simply in that sense saying, not that he was the one who begot. We know that God is the one through his word and through his spirit is the one who saves. But Paul was the instrument that was used. And so he has a unique relationship there. The reality is, is that Paul's been dealing with spiritual leadership. He's identified himself with many different metaphors already. He's talked about himself as a farmer and as a servant and as a steward, remember, as an under rower. And now he's going to identify himself with this familial relationship as a father. And, and truth, truly, all, all pastors are spiritual fathers. Not, not in the sense that I, I look around, very few of you, Am I responsible for leading you to the Lord? But certainly responsible for your spiritual growth, for your spiritual maturity. Yeah. As I look out this morning, I see Pastor Mike. You know, Pastor Mike's not the one who led me to the Lord, but I consider him my spiritual father. He, he raised me, in a sense, you know, mentored me, uh, and, and uh, thank you. I, I, on, on Father's Day, I want to I say thank you uh, for that investment. It, uh, but what I want you to understand this morning is this. All Christians are to be spiritual parents. Not, 
I, I, we have a lot of parents here, and I want to address you this morning. I want to talk to you parents this morning, but from a spiritual standpoint, all of us are to be reproducing, right? God has called us to reproduce. God has called us to take this gospel, the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ, to the lost. And when you lead someone to Christ through the gospel, you become a spiritual parent. Now, some of you have not experienced that, right? You've become a parent through reproduction. Some of you have never led someone to Jesus Christ. May I say that's to our shame, right? This is, I realize that we, you know, if you're out there sharing the gospel and you're telling people about Jesus and God has not burst, you know, through their heart to open their eyes and let them see, that's not your fault, right? But, are you sharing the gospel? Are you telling other people about Jesus? How will you ever lead someone to Christ if you don't tell them? How will they hear without a preacher? Paul said in Romans chapter 10. We, we need to be, as a people, right? And so this message is going to be directed towards fathers in a moment because I want to give you this morning five characteristics of a spiritual father. And so we're going to be able to take those characteristics of the Apostle Paul and we're going to be able to apply them to dads, to fathers, in a practical sense. But at the same time, each and every one of us as believers can apply these principles. And we must apply these principles. So, let's start, right? Again, what Paul is spiritually to the Corinthians, we must be practically as fathers, as dads. But number one, I want you to see in verse 14, a spiritual father loves his children. Uh, you might say, duh, right? No, no kidding. But listen, that's not, that's not a no-brainer, right? <laughs> I mean, even today, when you look at it on a biological level, just because you physically have a child doesn't mean you love and care for them. We see that. We've, we've, we, our eyes have been open to that through the, just through the foster system that we've been dealing with. And it's a sad situation. There are lots of men today who are having children, but they're not dads to their children. And sadly, there's a spiritual sense in which that is true as well. There are those who are very faithful in sharing the gospel. They'll lead someone to Christ, and that's where it stops. Now, what do we call someone who's a new Christian? We call them a... A baby, right? A baby in Christ, right? You get saved. You, you, you need to learn. You need to grow. But what happens a lot of times is you lead someone to Christ and you just dump them off. We have abandoned children who are not, they're outside the church because someone told them about Jesus, but nobody said, you need to be in church, you need to be reading your Bible, and you need to, you need to do this and that, and this is going to help you grow. Brothers and sisters, we must come alongside those babies in Christ. Well, Paul is a good spiritual dad, and he loves his children. The word is agapetos, right? It, it, the root is agape. This is a, the highest form of love. It's a selfless love, a sacrificial love, right? We talk about this type of love often. It's the love that God has demonstrated towards you and I. It's the kind of love that says, I want the best for you, even if it hurts me. It's the love that was demonstrated by Jesus Christ on the cross when he gave himself for us. Agape love. Paul says, I, I, my beloved children, I love you with this kind of love. In his, in his second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 12, in verses 14 and 15, he says, I will not be a burden, for I seek not what is yours but you. <laughs> for children are not obligated to save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. <laughs> What's Paul saying? I'll give everything for you. I'll give of myself. I'll give of my resources. And can I say, as parents, one of the greatest resources you can give to your children is you. <laughs> parents. Dads, your children need you in their life. <laughs> you need to be present. 
They need your time. All right? And so Paul's saying, I'm, I'm giving myself to you. Now, and from a spiritual sense, if you're going to produce spiritual children, if you're going to raise them up to maturity, then you're going to have to spend time. You're going to have to invest yourself in someone else. This is what the Apostle Paul has done. Paul spent 18 months with the people in Corinth, teaching them. Think of, he'll mention Timothy in a moment. He calls Timothy my son in the faith. He said, Timothy, you're coming with me. That's what a spiritual parent does. And brothers and sisters, some of us need to, need to make this happen, right? You've been in Christ. You've been growing. Now you need to invest in someone else, a younger Christian, a more immature Christian. You need to say, here, come with me. Now, as a parent, you know that doesn't always go well, right? <laughs> there, are, there are fathers here this morning whose hearts are breaking because they invested in their children, they shared with them the gospel, and they're away from the Lord, and they're outside of church, and your heart's breaking this morning. Well, the same thing can happen spiritually as well as you invest in investing in discipleship is really what we're talking about here, spiritual parenting. As you invest, it can be one of the most joyful things, just as parenting can be, but it can also be one of the most heartbreaking things. You remember at the end of, of, of uh, Paul's letter to Timothy, his second letter, he said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. There was a man who Paul invested his life in, much like Timothy, but Demas, he left breaking Paul's heart in the process. And as you, as you invest yourself in others, sometimes it will, it will hurt. The outcome won't be what you expected. I, I, can, I have, in my discipleship time with people, I've seen as many Demases as I have Timothys. And, and those Demases hurt. So a spiritual father loves his children. Number two, a spiritual father corrects his children. Right. Paul says, I did not write to shame you, but to admonish you. Right. It literally means to put in mind or to put something in someone's head. That's the, the picture here. Your KJV says to warn. All right? that's, the, that's kind of the idea. It means to, that you see someone who's heading in a direction, and you say, hey, I'm concerned about that. <laughs> That's not right. Here's what is right. All right, so there's a corrective nature to what Paul is saying here. I didn't want to shame you. They were ashamed, and they should have been ashamed, but that wasn't his intent. His intent was not to shame them, but to correct them, <laughs> to point them back to the cross. They were walking away from the, tr the true wisdom of God, and they were looking at the wisdom of the world, and Paul's pulling them back, correcting them. <laughs> now, certainly, as parents, this is a need, is it not? <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a sense in which the world and psychology has said we need to stay away from negativity with our children. We shouldn't tell them no, and we shouldn't... No! <laughs> All right, it's okay! All right, <laughs> We have a little thing in our family that we, we talk about. We, we're going to give you the gift of no, all right? Uh, that, sometimes no is a blessing. Right. And Paul's simply saying, no, you're going the wrong direction. Here's the direction you need to go. And as parents, we need to correct. You say, how do I do that? Well, Paul using the same word. Let me just share with you very quickly here. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. He says admonishing, correcting. How? As the word of God is dwelling in you. And so if you're going to be this corrective influence in the lives of your children and in your disciples, those of you who are spiritually parenting, then you must be in the word. <laughs> the word of God should dwell in you. That you may, right, because this is a correction that our children need, right? You're moving away from God, what, God, what God's Word says. We need, to, we need to line ourselves up with the Word of God. Well, you can only do that 
as you're in the word yourself. And as you're in the word, you, you can, I mean, the greatest counsel that I can give my children is, thus says the Lord. <laughs> right? This is what the word of God says. And, and so I can come alongside and, and show them from the word of God. And I can do the same thing at, just as a spiritual leader in the church. If you come to me for counseling, <laughs> I, don't have, I don't have a counseling degree, right? I don't have a PhD in psychology. What I do have is the Word of God. And that's what we're going to look at. I believe that God's Word has all that you need for life and for godliness. And so when we look at your life and we look at where you're at and we look at your situation, we say, here's what the Word of God says. Now what I know from my, my limited experience in counseling is this. Not everybody likes what God's Word says. Sometimes God's Word tells us things we don't want to hear. And so we say, no, you're heading in the wrong direction, and you need to line yourself up with this word. That's, that's correction. Paul, in Colossians 1.28, he said, Him we proclaim, warning everyone, same word, admonishing, teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we, we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's the goal. The goal is that we might make others more Christ-like. Right? Your goal as parents is not to have the picture-perfect family that you can point to and say, hey, I have good children. <laughs> Your goal as a parent is to make them more like Christ. That's the goal. So we do that through the Word of God. And can I say, this is the responsibility, again, of all of God's people. <laughs> not just the pastors, not just the Sunday school teachers, but parents, and yes, each and every one of you, Paul wrote to the Roman Corinthians in chapter 15 and verse 14, he said, I believe you're able to instruct, admonish, correct, one another. This should be happening as we're in the word of God and we're pointing people to Christ. A spiritual father loves his children, corrects his children, and number three, a spiritual father is an example for his children. Right, we see it in verse 16. Paul says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. Now, that's where we get our word mimic from. It means to copy, right? Paul says, look at me and be like me. Now, that seems somewhat arrogant, doesn't it? But we, we know Paul's not arrogant, right? He's already considered himself an under rower and a servant. If you go to Philippians chapter 3, he said, I have not already attained, <laughs> right? I'm not perfect. In fact, in chapter 11, we'll see Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so Paul simply, again, he's pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. He say, anything that you see in me that is like Jesus, copy that. Be like that. And so there's this, this aspect of being a father that just means be an example. Right? And, and certainly... To parents this morning, to, to dads this morning, one of the greatest needs that your children has is that you model for them what it looks like to follow Jesus. If you, if you want your children to know and love Jesus, then it must be demonstrated in your life. They've got to see it. Your children are not stupid, all right? They... The whole, do as I say, not as I do, that doesn't work. What are your children seeing about God from you? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, you, if you expect your children to want to go to church and, and want to be in church, then you know what? You should be in church. You should make it a priority in your life. If you want your children to grow up and go to church when they get out of the house, then you should make it a priority now in your family and in your house. If you want your children to pray, let them see you pray. Pray with them. If you want your children to be in the Word of God, then let them see you read the Word of God. So I used to come to my office and do my quiet time yeah, I, I have that personal pride, but my children never see me in the Word. And so now I, I'll, I'll do it at breakfast at the kitchen table where they can see me reading God's Word. 
I want them to see it. And I want to spend time with them in the Word of God. If you want them to memorize the Word, if you want them to hide God's Word in your heart, then you hide God's Word in your heart. If you want them to love God, then you love God. Let them see it in your life. This type of modeling is exactly what's needed within the church. I, you know, I can say, you know, when it comes to suffering, I haven't, I've experienced very little. But because of the example and the model of faithful men and women, I know that God will keep his promises in the midst of hard times. I, I stood beside brothers and sisters in Christ in some of the most difficult circumstances that you can imagine and I have seen them experience peace that passes understanding I've seen the God of all grace present in their life and so because of that example of a brother and sister a faithful testimony I can even before the suffering comes I can say what God I know I know that you keep your promises so I'm thankful for those spiritual parents that I've had, examples that I've had walk before me who have shown me that God is faithful, God is true. And so keep that in mind as you're going through difficult times. You're saying something to your family, to your children. You're saying something to your brothers and sisters in Christ in the way that you suffer. And we do that in countless other ways and areas of our life as well. We say something about God and how we respond to him. So be an example, be a model of what it means to know and to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's simply saying. (laughs) Look at me. That's not an easy thing to say, is it? (laughs) It's it's one of the last things I want to stand here and tell you to do. As your pastor, I don't want to say, look at me, but I know that people are looking. I know I'm going to give an account. I know that as your pastor, (laughs) it would be, Hypocritical for me to ask you to do something that I'm not willing to do. And so even though I don't want to say it, I have to say, look at me. Follow me. As I follow Christ. That's Paul's heart here. Number four, we see a spiritual father teaches his children. He teaches his children. Verse 17. He says, That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. This is tied closely to imitate me. He's saying, I want you to remember me, so I sent Timothy. (laughs) Why did he send Timothy? Because Timothy is Paul's faithful son in the Lord, and Timothy is following Paul, copying Paul, and he says, I want to remind you of my way of life, so I sent you Timothy. Because he's following me as I follow Christ. He said, I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So Paul says, I sent Timothy because I've taught Timothy. (laughs) I've taught him my ways, the same ways that I teach everywhere. And he's going to come and remind you of that. And I guess first of all, again, to parents, I would say, are you teaching your children? Are you training them? Maybe I should ask you in a different way. Are you teaching your children what's most important? Yeah, I see see parents spend countless hours teaching their children, training their children academically and athletically. And those things are not bad. Those things are good and they're helpful. But they're not essential. Do you realize that your children are one of the only earthly things that you can take with you to heaven? There's very few things on this earth that you can take with you. But by God's grace, through the gospel, you can spend eternity with your children. 
Are you teaching them what matters most? Are they learning about God's grace? Are they learning about their sin from you? Deuteronomy 6-7 says, You shall teach them diligently to your children. You say, what's them? It's the word. It's the law of God. Are you teaching your children the word? And let me just say to dads in particular, okay? Fathers, dads, we must step up in this area. The responsibility of teaching your children does not lie with the church. It doesn't rely with Troy or Sunday school teachers. And it doesn't rely with your wife. Not that your wife's not involved in teaching and training. She is. But you need to take the lead in spiritual things, dads. You need to take the lead in the Word, and in prayer. This has been a failure of men within the church who sit by while their wife and the church does what they are supposed to do. And dads, you're going to give an account for how you teach and train your children. At the same time, from a spiritual standpoint, this is exactly what discipleship looks like, right? We're teaching, we're training, we're investing. This is what Paul said to Timothy. Teach other men who will teach other men who will teach other men, right? Training up the faithful in 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So there's an investment, right, of teaching that takes place. And I know, even from a, this is why a lot of dads sit back and sit idly by. It's because they just simply say, I don't know what to do. The same thing happens in discipleship. Many of you say, I'm not going to take on that relationship because I just don't know what to do. It doesn't have to be complicated. <laughs> really, the only tool that you need is this book <laughs> and prayer. Now, I'm not saying there's not great and wonderful tools available to help you. Right? If, if you need a tool for family devotions, I will give you one. I have one in my office. I'll be happy to hand it to you. All right? As a dad, if you want a, a tool to help you walk through family devotions through the Word, I'll hand you one. Come see me after the service. It's yours, all right? Uh, we have the Word of Life Quiet Time we make available to you. Take advantage of that. The beautiful thing about that is everybody in your family can get a, a book that is right on their level, but you're on the same passage every day. A lot of times our family devotions consist of that. We'll just open up the day's passage from the Word of Life Quiet Time, and we'll talk about it together. <laughs> That's not complicated. You don't have to be a pastor, and you don't have to have a degree to lead your family in the Word. Just read it with them and pray with them. Teach them. Now, what Paul says here in verses 18 to 20 a kid is somewhat strong. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. Essentially, what Paul's saying is just, just wait till daddy gets home. Right? I mean, he's been there. You've heard that word, right? That's what he's saying. He says, you say I'm not coming, but I'm coming if the Lord wills. He clarifies because there's many times he wanted to come and God said, not yet. Close that door. Maybe later, right? And so he says, if the Lord wills, I'm coming again, and then we'll see your arrogant talk if there's anything to it. But he closes out with the last characteristic of a spiritual father in verse 21. A spiritual father disciplines his children. He says, what do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? I, I just... I want to remind you that discipline is part of being a loving father. There's a, there's a part where Paul says, I want to come to you in gentleness, but if this is not corrected when I come, I'm going to get the rod out. And you say, how unloving. No. The most loving thing a father can do is discipline their children when it's needed. Right? This, is, this reflects the very heart of God himself. If, if you look it up for yourself, Hebrews chapter 12. I'll read verse 6 for you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. 
is God the Father, right? Because he loves you, he disciplines you. This is one of the most loving things that you can do for your children. In fact, one of the most unloving things you can do for your children is not to discipline them. I'm not talking about abuse, okay? I, I, I think even within the church, we've kind of stepped away. From, I don't want to spank my children. I want to, you know, and we're so concerned about, but listen, we're not talking about abusive behavior. We're not talking about disciplining and anger. In fact, I don't think you should spank your children in anger. I'm not going to say that I've never done that, all right? Because I have. I've had to actually go to my, my daughters and, and apologize and, and just confess that I was not acting in self-control in that moment. <laughs> I, anytime I talk about parenting, I, I'm completely overwhelmed because I'm right in the middle of this with you guys. And, and I, I want to share principles from the Word because I'm far from a perfect parent. But I know this, when discipline is done rightly, it's a loving thing. So there are times where correction is needed, right? Where the, the admonition took place, you're going the wrong way, but there was no turning back to the right. And in that moment, when that, when that disobedience occurs, and it's rebellion against you, and it's rebellion against God, there's a, there's a need, a necessity for discipline. And the way in which that done is very loving and very gently. My daughters know that I despise spanking them, that I, I hate it. <laughs> I know you, know, you always hear that, that phrase, right? this hurts me more than it hurts you, and no kid believes that. Right? But... As a parent, you know that feeling, don't you? By and large, I'll sit down with my children and I'll just explain. Here's what the Word of God says. Here's what happened. <laughs> and here's why you're going to get us banking. So we just, this is what's going to happen. This is why. It's because of this attitude. And then we'll do it. And then I'll hug them, and I'll tell them I love them, and we'll pray about it. And that's, that's in my heart, the way discipline should lead. And I don't think every, every issue should lead to a spanking, right? There's lots of ways to deal with disobedience. There's lots of ways to discipline. But we must discipline. So let's not buy into the philosophy of the world that says we should never say no. <laughs> let's not buy into that philosophy that all discipline is abusive. We need to lovingly care for our children. And part of that is discipline. And that, that takes place even within the context of spiritual discipleship, does it not? There are times where someone you're coming alongside and you're disciplining, you're, you're, you're discipling, where they're walking in a way that's not good for them. And you can say, hey, you're heading in the wrong way, and they'll just keep on walking. And the Lord, thankfully, has steps in place for how to deal with sin in the church and how to deal with, in fact, we're going to see that as we come to chapter 5, and we talk about church discipline. That's next. That's not a popular subject, but we're going we're gonna to talk about it. Obviously, I think there's a good deal for dads here this morning. Let me, let me say, first of all, for children, any way in which you see this in your parents, however imperfectly, honor them. <laughs> honor your dads. <laughs> you know, none of us are perfect. <laughs> and we're going to fail and we're going to fall and we want to point you to Christ, all right? So honor your dads. Wives... <laughs> Today is not the day to be the Holy Spirit. All right? It's not your responsibility to say, hey, honey, <laughs> did you hear that? Let the Holy Spirit work through His Word. Dads, let us be the fathers that God has called us to be. 
This matters. It matters for now, it matters for the future, and it matters for eternity. Let me share with you just a brief, I shared this one other time, and I find it fascinating. Um, there was a study done in New York of two separate families in their lines, in their lineage. And uh, one was the family of a man named Max Jukes, who you probably haven't heard of. Uh, he did not follow the Lord, nor did his wife. And they said among over the 1,200 descendants studied, 310 were professional vagrants. 440 were physically wrecked by lies of debauchery and uncleanness. 130 went to the penitentiary, the penitentiary for an average of 13 years each. Seven of them were murderers. 100 were alcoholics. 60 were habitual thieves. 190 were prostitutes. Of the 20 who learned a trade, 10 learned it in a state prison. Collectively, they cost the state of New York over a million dollars. Just tracing the line of one family. And then they trace the line of a second family, a man named Jonathan Edwards. Maybe you have heard of him and his wife, Sarah. They love the Lord. Among his descendants, 300 became pastors, missionaries, and theology professors. Over 100 became college professors. Over 100 became lawyers, including 30 judges. Over 60 became physicians. 60 authored good books. 14 became presidents of universities. Three became United States congressmen and one, you've heard of this man, although he was the black sheep, spiritually became the vice president of the United States, Aaron Burr Jr. He was Jonathan Edwards' grandson. So just a line of a family who invested, right? Who taught and trained their children, who taught and trained their children. And we see that pattern. We saw that Wednesday night, if you weren't with us, we, looked, we talked about Asaph and how we see his family uh, involved in spiritual worship and leadership for 400 years. <laughs> yeah. what, a, what a great testimony. But it starts with you, mom, dad, parents, in the home. There's a message here this morning for the church as well as a whole. One that's dear to my heart as your pastor. You know, these type of relationships, these discipleship relationships, the spiritual parenting. It needs to exist. It needs to happen if we're going to fulfill our purpose as a church. You say, how does that happen? Well, it happens first and foremost as you're sharing the gospel, as you're leading other people to Christ. And when you lead other people to Christ, it doesn't stop there. Then you teach and you train and you raise them up in the ways of the Lord. I have told you this often, and I'll tell you again. You need to either be discipling someone, or you need to be discipled. If we're going to fulfill our church, this is part of the Great Commission to the glory of God. I think it would be tragic, I think, to, to talk about spiritual fathers and not at least ask this morning, are you part of the family of God? Do you know God as your heavenly Father? John chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, But to all who did receive Him, talking about Jesus Christ, to those who received Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become the children of God. Have you come to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and enter into this incredible family of God? If not, you can do that today. <laughs> As you understand your sin and you turn away from it and you trust in Christ, God will he'll call you son, <laughs> daughter. He'll bring you into his family, adopted into, and you can be part of the family of God today. I would invite you to that if, if you're here and you're concerned about your salvation. Please don't leave this place without talking to me. We're going to just close in prayer here this morning. Uh, and if, if the Spirit of God is working, then respond. Uh, if we can be of help to you, please let us know. But let